Okay, so I think you should all just be relaxed. You are relaxed. But in your seat, just perhaps put your shoulders back, drop them, and become aware of your breathing. And as you do so, let the body relax. And just feel at ease within yourself. And feeling easy, imagine Shakyamuni Buddha, the Bodhisattvas and the Arahats, your spiritual mentors, and all of the guides appear before you, radiant with golden light. And imagine your parents and your friends and family, difficult people and strangers surround you. And acknowledge our shared desires for happiness and freedom from suffering. And you think that you'd like to develop your wisdom and your compassion and your skill to be able to effortlessly respond to the needs of others and help others put an end to their suffering. And then with this wish, Decide to turn to the three jewels, the three rare sublime ones, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. And to take refuge in them. And then join me in saying, I go for refuge until I am enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merits I create through listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I am enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merits I create through listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I am enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merits I create through listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. And in response to this wish of ours, Imagine colorful nectars and lights showering down from the radiant beings of the refuge field. And you think that every hindrance and obstacle to your deepest happiness uh, vanish. And having been cleansed by the wisdom and love of the Buddhas, recollect the four immeasurable thoughts and decide to develop these yourself and to establish every other living being within those four boundless states. And then join me in saying, may all sentient beings have happiness and its causes. May all sentient beings be free from suffering and its causes. May all sentient beings never be separated from the happiness that is without suffering. And may all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from the bias of attachment for friends and hatred for enemies. And in response to this wish of ours, again, colorful nectars and lights shower down from the radiant beings in the refuge field. Every hindrance and obstacle to our spiritual progress 
washed away. So that we glow with an inner clear light. And smiling. We remember the beings above us, the Buddhists and the Bodhisattvas, and wishing to possess similar qualities as they have, we prepare ourselves to gather the two accumulations of merit and wisdom so that we can become enlightened for the benefit of others. And we say, Reverently, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering, actual, and imagined. I declare all my negative actions accumulated since beginning this time and rejoice in the merit of all holy and ordinary beings. Please remain until the end of psychic existence and turn the wheel of Dharma for living beings. I dedicate my own and others' merits to the great enlightenment. So everything appears uh, real to us, but it's not as real as it seems. In other words, um, phenomena do not exist uh, independent from us. If we ask how do things exist, we find that they're just ideas and given names. So as we wish to develop uh, the potential we have to eliminate the greed and selfishness that we're entrapped by, we're going to imagine giving away um, all of our desires, the body that we cling to, our ideas of, of merit and enlightenment, of being good and bad, and think that in the absence of all these mental constructs, a wonderful pure land appears. And we offer this to the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas um, in front and above us. And so we say that this ground, anointed with perfume and strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Meru, four continents, the sun and the moon, I imagine this as a Buddha field and offer it. May all living beings enjoy this pure land. Idam Guru Ratna Mandala Kam Narayatayam. That's been released, and the Buddha accepts the offering and he smiles at us with delight. We look up into his eyes. We see that the eyes of the Buddha are full with kindness, compassion, and wisdom. And we feel uh, accepted and at ease. And so we ask the Buddha to help us stop uh, all wrong thoughts, to help us develop all the correct thoughts, and to remove inner, outer, and secret obstacles. And say, Guru Buddha, please bless us and all beings like us to understand, to feel, and to develop impartiality, to recognize everyone as our own dear mother, and to remember her kindness and want to repay it. And feeling love for all beings, develop compassion for them, and a determination to bring about enlightenment for their benefit. So in response to this series of wishes, uh, an emanation of the Buddha leaves his own heart, he moves through space and comes to rest above the crown of your head. And facing in the same direction you are, this emanation now begins to descend. And it enters the crown of your head 
and comes down through your skull and through your throat and into your chest. And it rests just above your heart. Whereby its radiance expands, filling your chest, your arms and legs and your head and your mind with light. And the light goes out through the pores of your skin and begins to fill the 10 directions of space. And wherever there are beings, they abide within space. While they are enveloped by this light and utterly transformed, Each of them awakens into the fully enlightened state of a Buddha. And a sort of sense of wonder overcomes us, thinking, wow, I've really accomplished my purpose. And from the 10 directions of space, the light retreats and it re-enters your heart. And you can feel your body breathing itself. And you feel embodied. And there's a realization that this meditation was one of imagination, which has imprinted the mind. But this potential for full awakening is present within all of us. And what we need to do is to actualize it. And this depends upon the stages of a path. So I think that you want to accomplish each stage of the spiritual path to accomplish your own and others' purpose. And then breathing in deeply through your nostrils, exhale through your mouth, and in your own time, let your eyes flutter open and move your body in whichever way you'd like to so that you feel quite at ease and comfortable. Okay, so let's have a look at what we're going to do today. Um, so we're going to begin by doing a brief uh, review of last week's class. So as you know, last week we looked at these topics, the truth of Dukkha, its nature, how to engage in it, and the results of the engagement. We had the analogy of the barren wound, and then we looked at the characteristics of these four noble truths that are realized by the happy chaps, the fellows who have seen clearly into how things exist. And today we'll be looking at this truth of origin. And very much like last week, it has uh, three cycles. It's got different characteristics and there are misconceptions about these characteristics. So we're gonna correct those and then look at how we can apply what we learned today um, daily. And to help me present this class, I've realized I've sort of relied on material like this here. So all of this material here has got aspects of the Four Noble Truths. Uh, probably the most deepest and widest presentation is this one here called Samsara, Nirvana, and Buddha Nature on the bottom. These books are all written by His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Venerable Tupton Children, and they're really good. 
you know, um, they're not hard to understand. And what I really appreciate, of course, is the depth and the width of each of them. Each of them. So let's begin by having a look at what we call the uh, truth of origin. So it's, it's defined as that which is counted as a contaminated cause and belongs to the thoroughly afflicted side of truth. Now, last week when we looked at the truth of Dukkha, it was defined as that which is counted as a contaminated effect and belongs to the thoroughly afflicted side of truth. So here you can see a sort of relationship between the first noble truth and the second. And this truth here, the truth of origin, is the cause of the first truth known by noble people. And they both belong to what's called the thoroughly afflicted side of truth. And the thoroughly afflicted side of truth is just a category to explain suffering and how it's produced. All the different forms of suffering and the different causes of it. And just like last week's presentation, when the when the Buddha talked of the when the Buddha spoke of these four noble truths, he um, presented it in sort of three different ways um, for persons of different capacity. So in other words, so when we be, we begin our practice, is a way of explaining the truth of origin uh, and its effect, um, dukkha. Uh, if we've engaged in the path for some time, there's a way of explaining it there. And if we really thought about this deeply and seen that there's no difference between ourselves and others, we'll see there's another way of presenting the truth of origin and the truth of Dukkha. So we begin by looking at these true origins from the perspective of the practitioner. So as a beginner, We're looking at what they call the 10 non-virtues. So these are seen as the origins of suffering. And we're seen as the, um, we're also looking at the coarse afflictions that motivate them. So things like uh, lust, anger, greed, doubt, these sort of uh, afflictions. When we look a bit deeper, well, we start looking at negative karma and how it, how it causes a rebirth within cyclic existence. And of course, this negative karma uh, comes out of craving and uh, ignorance. And this shows us how we cycle within this phenomenon called samsara. When we look at the point from the point of view of the middling practitioner, you know, the goal here is for this person to put an end to the negative karma that causes rebirth in samsara. And by doing that, they achieve what's called a liberation or personal freedom. But um, when you find yourself as a middling practitioner, it... it, it it doesn't take much to just look around at your brother, your sister, your wife, your husband, or your children and go, damn, we're all in the same situation. So just getting out of it myself, uh, you know, there's something not quite right there. You know, we sort of think, what about everybody else? What about my brothers and my sisters, my father, my mother? So we start to look at some of the deeper origins of suffering. And we see that we have the self-grasping and the self-centered attitude. And uh, along with these they call afflictive obscurations, there is a deeper type of obscuration called cognitive obscurations. And so these are all seen as the uh, origins of suffering.
And so when this were explained to the, these practitioners, um, the Buddha did it in a, a quite a very skillful way. He talked about these origins and the what they call the three cycles. And so he began by talking about the nature of the truth of origin. And like last week, we looked at the nature of the truth of Dukkha. We saw that the nature of it was these five contaminated and appropriated aggregates. And we had to identify that as being Dukkha, true Dukkha. Here, we're looking at the origins of this, of this true Dukkha. We need to identify the afflictions especially craving and karma. And when we can do that, we can say, oh, this is the noble truth of the origin of Dukkha. So how do we identify? Uh, so now that we've identified the nature, is how do we engage? How do we practice? So we need to become aware of these four distorted attributes uh, in relationship to the true origins. And when we see that we have these distortions, we've got to correct them. And by doing so, we abandon the origins of Dukkha. Now, the result of this uh, identifying the nature and engaging with our understanding produces a realization. And this realization is that on the conventional level, true origins exist, we experience them. But if we look deeper into their nature, we find their nature does not inherently exist, does not truly exist. It doesn't exist in the way that it appears to us. And by doing that, we understand, or we fully understand, the origins of our dukkha. So now we get a few moments just to chat about what this, what this might mean to us. I know I've covered this very... Um, quickly, and there's only a few words. Um, mm. And yet it's, uh, there's a, I mean, there's a lot of material there, isn't there? Mm. Yeah, there's a lot to think about. So Miffy, what would you like to say? I, I just really like how um, you can see the, the trajectory from being a lower scope to middle scope to higher scope, because I just find it really helpful. And I tend to go up and down that <laughs> trajectory a lot. But just to know that, um, you know, the avoiding the 10 non-virtuous actions, that's just the starting point, whereas for a long time I thought that was just it <laughs> and I couldn't figure out. I thought there was something missing in, in, the, in, the, in the program, but I didn't realise what that it was to do with the middle scope and a higher scope kind of mm -hmm. approach. So, um, yeah, even though, like, how long do you spend on that lower scope of avoiding the 10 non-virtuous actions, or do you do all three scopes at once? Uh, well, it's funny when you say how long do we spend this, so until it's quite natural, <laughs> until we, we actually do that. Yeah. So oftentimes when you take teachings by the, the lamas or, or anybody who's been into Dharma for some time, you know, when they talk about karma, this, this topic, um, or true origins. You know, that's the baseline right there, isn't it? Just abandon these type, these 10 unskillful behaviours. Stop. Um, it's a way of just sort of... Yes, so, so these teachings, the Buddhist teachings, are uh, just about identifying suffering and abandoning its causes. And, and it's like... like so, and then there's a, you know, how do you do it and what's the result? So the 10 non-virtuous behaviors or the 10 unskillful behaviors are a way of looking and going, look, this is how you create your suffering. This, this is, this is you know, um, you, if you do these 
unskillful things, if you kill people, if you steal from them, if you steal their partners, it's going to produce problems for you. So, so stop it. And then, then you look a little deeper and say, well, what's driving us to do that? Why do we do it? And then this takes us up to the, ne the next level, right? We start now looking deeper into the causes of our behaviours. So we find that a lot of it's sort of repetitive and it's driven by thoughts, ideas we have. And so then we say, oh, okay, to, um, yeah, there's this, I can, I, yeah, I, can, I can restrain myself from killing, stealing, sexual misconduct. You know, I'm really working on stopping lying and harsh speech and so forth to a bit more difficult. Um, if, if you don't understand that there's um, deeper causes for those behaviours, we, we, it'll just keep on happening. You know, the, these effects have deeper causes. So we need to sort of, um, like I say, acknowledge those and realise, oh, gosh, I want a trajectory here. You know, and then we come up to, to, the, to the great scope and see... Well, at a very deep level, it's this, uh, it's this ignorance and these um, behaviours that are coming out of it that I'm not aware of. You know, the sense of, and at one very deep level, there's a sense of I matter more to myself than anybody else. And so, um, yeah, I guess it's becoming a bit more aware of the subtle causes. And, and Susan, you have your hand raised? There you go. <laughs> yes, hi, Annie. Hi, um, I don't, I'm not sure if I'm interpreting that correctly. I missed your first class, unfortunately. But I could, I cannot, I cannot envision myself being above um, beginning level or like the small, smallest level. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, it's one thing to, to not engage in those behaviors. Let's say you, don't engage in them, but it's no. the thinking process. It's it's the mental process. What's in your mind that so maybe you've gotten rid of all those behaviors. Your your life is clean. You know you don't do any of those things, but then something happens, and you mentally you're thrown into some kind kind of turmoil where you react in a negative way. And so I mean. For me to think, oh, you're above all that. You've reached this stage, that stage. You're above this, doing these certain things, and now you only need to focus on ignorance. I cannot envision being, considering myself graduated, if you will, to that stage. And I think if I did think of myself that way, I would be delusional, really. <laughs> oh, very good. <laughs> That's good thinking, Susan. <laughs> That's great thinking. <laughs> good Thank idea. You. Yeah, yeah. And it's, I, we should all sort of think like that, I think. You know, I think, you know, like for the, for the ordained, it's like this, you know, like you, it's like this deliberate thing, right? You know, you, you go, okay, so that, that bottom part of behaving like that, I'm, I'm taking on these robes and, and that's, you know, that's not going to happen. I'm not going to do that. But then it's like you're saying, so the next step is in working on the mind, isn't it? You know, so it really helps to, to become ordained and to go, okay, that, that's that lower stuff, I'm not doing that. But I know it's all being driven by the mind. So that's where the real workshop is, you know. But just, at the same time, it's just like you say, we don't want to be arrogant or think you're, you know, you just don't know. You know, it's stuff can come together and then you start doing things you thought you wouldn't do. And and that's that's a fact, you know. So I would think just um yeah, you know, in the in an external appearance, you know, you could you other people can see that you're not killing people and you're not stealing and and you know, you're not engaging in harsh speech and all that sort of stuff. They don't see that this is really being driven by the mind. 
you know, and, and that's our business, isn't it? As a as a person of Dharma, we, we got to go. This whole thing is driven by what only I know about, and and that's where my responsibility lies. Barbara. Bob, you've got your hand up. What would you like to say? Yeah, I was just going to say that Venerable Rabina always stresses to know where we're at. You know, to just know where we're at in the process. And I mean, I've really found it is not a linear process at all. <laughs> That's not. That's right. <laughs> at all. And Susan, <laughs> you know where you're at. And and again, Venerable always stresses how important that is. And she also talks a lot about grist for the mill. And sometimes the challenge that I have is I'll think, okay, this really, this situation is grist for the mill. I'm going in. <laughs> and then <laughs> sometimes it works and I can be fairly skillful. And other times it's like, wow, this isn't a benefit to the person I'm with. It's not a benefit to me. And then I realize in that time, I'm not there. And then I back off. Mm. I think, too, I don't want to just always play it safe. So I will try to assess where I'm at in a situation. And if it's a little bit challenging, that's grist for my mill. Mm -hmm. That's how I'm going to get better at it. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, so this, this, this sort of, you know, these slides that I've put up, and sort of breaking it up into small, middle, and great in terms of the levels of the practitioner. Uh, and then in terms of the origin and the three cycles. Um, although when you look at them, it's sort of quite clear. Um, in terms of the, our practice, it's not like that. Uh, Michael. I agree with what everybody else has said that like life is much more like a roller coaster with lots of twists and right. and, and loop to loops and all those other things, right? And you and you finally figure you got past the loop to loop, then you find out the next corner there there's a little there's a little shortcut that takes you back to where you were, right? <laughs> yeah. But I, I just want to make sure I understood that um, not the last slide, but the second to the last one where you had the small, um, middling and, and great scope. Those yeah. things were not the motivating factors. No, the they're not the motive. Those are the goals of that. Uh, 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 those are my goals or our goals to try and cope, to deal with those things if you're in there. And, and I think, as everybody said, you're, you're kind of always in great middling and, 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 and great, I mean, in small and middling scope all the time anyway, right? You get, yeah. It's kind of where I'm spending my life. But but it's that's not the motivating factors for me to get through that. But that's the goal is to... Um, Detached from them. I, I started to say renounce them. I, then I started to overcome them, but I guess it's really to detach from those things. Yeah, they're more sort of, um, what can I say? Um, like I said, well, it's not so much the, the motivation, it's more the activity that you're doing. Yeah. You know, so it doesn't matter whether our, 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 we're, we're of great scope. If you're of great scope, you're not killing people and you're not stealing mm -hmm. and so forth. You know, you, you're, you're behaving there. Not only that, but you're right in the middle too. You know, okay, behaviors are driving this, my mind, so I need to be careful with my mind. Um, Eddie, isn't, isn't also the motivations, I mean, they're to do with the scope as well. So the motivation is always to overcome our suffering, isn't it? We've got suffering and we want to do something about it and then... Um, either we don't want to make things worse or we want to get out of samsara altogether. So th those are the, the the driving force really is suffering, isn't it? And we don't want it. <laughs> yeah, and then what your capacity is to do within that. You know, so this, um, it's, it's sort of got like, um, it encapsulates two things. So you, well, you could look at it as, the behaviors of one person, right, like ourselves. Right? Okay, so I, I, I wish, I've, 
read about this, I've thought about it, I think enlightenment's got to be the goal. I've, I've got to achieve that. Um, okay, so, so you see, Kai, you know what you need to abandon. You know that all of the suffering is coming out of self-grasping and, and selfishness. And the fact that I look at the world, it appears to be separate from me. So that's the cognitive distortion. So that, that's the situation I'm in. Yeah. Uh, now, what do I do in relationship to that? Well, I don't kill, I don't steal. I, I restrain myself from the 10 non-virtues. I understand that they're coming, they're driven by the mind and my habitual responses. So I try working up in the middle level as well. So when you look at, from the point of view of a single person, you're going through all of these. It's all part of your, it's all the grist, right? But, you, but then you can also go, okay, let's take a step one person at a time. As, and the first person comes to the Buddha Dharma or, or not, right? Because the abandonment of the 10 non-virtues doesn't require you to be a Buddhist. But there are plenty of people that don't kill, steal, engage in sexual misconduct, don't they? And they're just trying to like, live a good life, a decent life. And they don't want to hurt people, they don't want to hurt themselves. And that's where they basically stay. They want to be happy in this life and maybe not even have an idea of future lives and so forth. But if they did, they go, this is, this is what I'm capable of doing and this is what I'm going to do. And that's, that's fine. Then you might get the person who goes along and goes, you, you know, like, um, no, it's not fine for me. I need to really get at the causes of this. And they seek their own personal freedom from the afflictions. And that's it for them. So they just, they combine the two, the small scope and the middle scope. They don't move up to a mind of enlightenment and becoming a Buddha. They just stay within those two scopes. And then you get the person who's, you know, larger heart, bigger way of thinking. And then they go to the, to the uh, great scope. And then they have to practice small, middling, and great. So we can take it from you know, the single practitioner that can do uh, all of them, or you can just take a single practitioner and just does one part of it. Both work. I guess let's have a little meditation. Um, yeah, so let's get comfortable in your seat. So you're, you are in an upright position and you can close your eyes or just maintain a soft gaze. And to anchor yourself in the present, just become aware of the gentle rise and fall of the chest as you breathe normally and naturally. So the truth of origin reveals that suffering has specific causes. We have karma and afflictive emotions. Karma and confusion. Now, both karma and the afflictions contribute to our cyclic existence. But of the two, karma and afflictions, afflictions are the primary cause. Can you see how your own afflictions um, 
create unskillful behaviors. And how the two of them produce suffering. So if you can imagine a single seed that could produce a flower, that seed will not become a flower without contributing conditions. The seed needs sunlight, soil, water, warmth, a lot of different conditions. In the same way, karma alone cannot cause suffering. Karma requires affliction. The karma is activity, action. So we've got this action that requires an affliction. Can you think of any way that you yourself um, might be able to be equanimous towards your own experiences? So you have behaviors, They're the seeds, the karma, and they require the affliction. Your job is to keep the affliction away from the karma, the seed. While we're sitting and we're breathing, just notice the activity of the mind itself. It's a natural sense of reactivity. And you just sort of rest without having the mind cling to its objects. Without the clinging, uh, the seed of karma cannot flourish. Now, breathe in deeply through your nostrils and exhale. Now just allow your attention now to come back um, into your room and find yourself in front of the screen. Um, Barbara, yes? Eddie? Could we talk a little bit more about karma and delusions? Because I kind of had it switched around. My understanding from what you said is that the delusions are the driving force. Mm -hmm. And I always thought that our karma and our propensities, our mm -hmm. habits yeah. come from our karma. Like I've always, and I'm grateful for this, I've always been a person whose glass is half full. 
It's never half empty. It's always half full. And I've always thought that I didn't decide. That's just my karma. That I look at things the okay. way I look at them. Sure. Yep. But did I understand you correctly that delusions are more of a driving force than karma? Because I always thought that karma, one of the ways that it ripens is our habits. Our habit to kill, our habit to lie, our habit to be kind, our habit to be loving. Am I? Do you know what I'm asking? Can we just yeah, yeah. talk so, about that? So we did say that these these this habit, right? That's the karma. Right? So now, if you think about this, so so it requires something more to kick it off, right? So, you, so you've got to have it, but you're not always behaving habitually, are you? Right? Sometimes it's just waiting. Right? So you need something else to act on it. So, you know, when they, and when they talk, so this is the idea of using the idea of seeds and water and soil and warmth and all those sort of things. So and then that's the, the delusion, seeds, which is yeah, the that's that, Yeah, so they need to get together. Uh, then, then the seed flourishes, then the seed grows. But just having a habit alone, it's not a problem. Uh, so this is what I was saying, you know, when we, when we sit and meditate, uh, if you, even just on the breath, uh, there is a propensity to move off its object, isn't there? Uh, um, and that's, let's say, is it? It isn't that. Then the 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 reason we move off the breath is because we're um, either being attached to something or averse to something. The habit might be just to stay on the breath, but how come we can't? <laughs> Because we're, you know, all of the subtle disturbing emotions are kicking in in terms of attachment or aversion. So, uh, no, so it's a bit like this. Right? So our habit is not to stay on the breath, right? It's not to stay on its object. Right? It wanders off all the time. So we're going to go, okay, I want to create a new habit. I want to place my mind on the object. That's the habit I want, I want to now create. So what drives it? Why is that? Why do we get distracted? I mean, it's distraction that doesn't have us do that, isn't it? How we get distracted. So we're being driven to get activity again, but it's driven by the delusions. There's, there's material in the text, Barbara, where they talk about the uh, the difference between having the, the of, of what's primary, whether it's the delusion or the karma. So they say, yeah, you can get rid of all many of these habits, but they come back really quickly with the delusion. All it requires is the delusion will create more habit. This, I, I can't find this. I've got this way of, of, in my head, like, and I'm finding it really difficult to articulate it. Um, Gosh. Just come back to it when we, yeah. Yeah, okay, as we yeah. go through, because I think the rest of the class is actually right on this topic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So let's, well, let's have a look at, um, yeah, so these origins of suffering. We'll go through that.
So the truth of origin has got four attributes. They're called causes, origins, strong producers, and conditions. Or um, basically we're talking about the same thing, but they're just the word, they use different words. And there's a, a point for using the different words. So when we look at the word uh, causes, let's have a look at that first. So of the different causes for suffering, for dukkha, craving and karma are the causes. And so the karma is like um, activity. Um, and we can look at this activity in terms of its of cause or effect. And often when they describe it, you know, karma is often seen as, as a, 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 an action that's been accomplished. But that's one way of looking at it. And the other one is this um, activity where we call it um, motivation. What's the motivation? So we have karma as cause and then karma as effect. So if you think of this, Barbara, it's like um, using the plant analogy, right? So as cause, it's the seed. Uh, so the seed is the cause for the plant. And the plant is the effect of that seed, isn't it? So we've got karma as cause and karma as effect. Now, to have the um, just the seed alone, like we said before, the seed alone, you don't have a plant when you've got a seed. And, you know, the example I often give and I'm often thought is like, you know, if you just have a packet full of seeds, you don't have a garden full of plants. Uh, you can just put those seeds in the cupboard or in a jar and, hey, it's fine. It's no problem, is it? You're not going to get the plants. There's no way you can get the plants just because you've got seeds. But if you take those seeds and you put them in the ground and give them water and moisture and all these other factors, these other conditions, then that seed, now it's got the right conditions, now it can turn into a plant. So, Eddie, then, are you saying that the um, the disturbing emotions, the afflictions, yeah. are actually the conditions? That's right. So that so this is why they're the they're the primary thing. If you just have the the karma itself, like I said, it's not it's not a problem. You don't have the, they don't meet the conditions. Hey, you're fine. But it's very much like like you were saying, Susan. You know, previously, you don't think we're above it. <laughs> I mean, those seeds are just sitting there, right? And all this needs to happen is we've got to meet the right conditions. And hello, we've got a garden full of wildness and trouble, right? But if we don't meet them, we say, well, I'm fine. Everything is good. And so this is what I often say, you know, in terms of the, the, the arahats, what they've done is remove these conditions. Because they know the primary of, of these conditions, whether it be karma or, or the craving. If I remove the craving, the suffering can't flourish. There will not be seeds there. There are seeds there, but hey, I'm fine. I have no grasping at them. I have no clinging or craving. Yeah. So this is what I was, I was trying to bring up, like, like when we meditate, right? And we have this, these, um, you can feel it in yourself, right? Yeah, you want to move off. You want to do things. So then the instruction often is, you don't need to fight here. Relax, relax. Yeah. Don't let the clinging get a chance to it. How do you stop it? Relax. Uh, don't let the clinging take place. You know, you can feel it. You know what's going on. 
but I'm just going to stay right where I am and just relax a little more. That's one method. The other, of course, is you actually put up an antidote, you know, and you go, okay, so this is what's going on. I need to oppose it. And you, you, you apply a different type of thought. So this is the, you know, behind the, when you often hear these presentations of um, like karma, for instance, there, there, you know, then you'll know, okay, so now the focus is, is on these seeds, these causes of suffering. Uh, but, but like I said, it's, when you look at them, the, as you'll see shortly about the causes of suffering, you've got to remember there are two. But, but the, the primary, if you just went, like, it's not one, it's these two. <laughs> but if you look at which one is primary, you go, well, the conditions. It's like I say, like you can have the causes there, and we do have them, don't we? But the causes are there, right? But if we don't meet the conditions, hey, we're fine. Yeah, but as soon as we meet the conditions, now we're not fine. Eddie, are you saying like if I had the genetics to be an alcoholic? Yep. Yeah, it's like this. That's right. But I never get exposed to alcohol, or I get exposed, but I never drink. Yeah. That, 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 that's yeah. what you're about. One is the, the cause, but the other is the condition. Yeah, that's right. And the alcohol is the condition that allows that genetics to be yeah. Uh, pressed. And to you become a drunk. That's right. Yeah, I like that, Michael. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. And this is, like I was saying before, Susan's example, this is why we need to be uh, careful. At least I always tell myself, look, you know, don't think you're, you're too crash hot, right? Because it just might mean you haven't met the condition yet. But Eddie, it also gives us a lot of hope because um, just the idea of being able to eradicate all those seeds it can be quite overwhelming. But you can really determine, okay, I'm going to put in place the best possible conditions to you know, keep myself safe yeah, <laughs> and others right. safe. Yeah, yeah. And so this is also why Barbara, you know, they go, yeah. This is why so much emphasis is put on the wisdom realizing emptiness. You know, because, because that shoots down all all the conditions. So the idea here is. Um, so we know here that these are the causes, right? This is the idea to go, okay, so craving and karma or delusion and karma or the afflictions and karma, they're the causes. And there are, as you can see here, there are two causes. So, so why are we told this? What's the point of being introduced to this idea? Look, there are these two causes for our suffering. Why do we need to know that? What's the point? The idea is to stop us thinking that um, that there are no causes for our suffering, but, or that it occurs randomly. So what this means is that whenever we experience suffering, we can look at it and go, okay, so there's two factors at play here. I've ran into the conditions, but my mind is also in play too. This, the, um, I have the conditions are within me. One is called karma, and the other is called affliction. Now, now just suppose, Barbara, that, that I have a big problem with you, for instance, right? So I look at you and go, okay, so in terms of cause and condition, which would Barbara be? You go, well, she's not the affliction and she's not the karma. So I can rule both those out, right? So it's not coming from you. So, but, so is, is Barbara a cause or a condition? I'm you know, a catalyst. Well, Am I a catalyst? Yeah. Well, you could say, yeah, you could say, yep, you're a catalyst. 
Right? You're you're one of the one of the conditions. But it's like, you know, it's the point when I don't meet Barbara, hey, I'm fine. You know, but when I meet her, now, now I'm deluded, I get upset. So we can ask ourselves here, so if, if we're looking at you, Barbara, as a cause or a condition, you can say, well, what type of cause? What type of condition? Because you're certainly not the affliction and you're not the karma. Uh, so this is something that, 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 that we can do too. Uh, and this is the idea to think that there's, there's a, um, the idea here is that you've got to look at, when we ask this, why am I suffering? The simplest answer is you look, you're, you're looking for a reason, aren't you? And your reason has got to come back to, it's well, there's these two causes, affliction and karma. So obviously I've got the potential for it. This is the seed. But the seed is being met up with a way of thinking. I'm clinging or craving to a particular way of looking at something. So never think, in other words, that suffering does not have causes. But suffering has causes. And we understand them to be karma and delusion. It never occurs randomly. Uh, it's just that the cause and condition, they, they meet and, hey, now, now you've got it. So when they say like, like um, hmm, I'll just leave that there. So this is the first thing to hold on to. The second is this term origins. So here we can understand that these two, the craving and the karma, these are the, the origins of suffering. And like, why? Because they repeatedly produce all the diverse forms of it. So this is being not just... Um, it's not just the portion of it, but it's like we look back in the past, the present, and any type of future suffering we, we're going to experience, we can put it down to these two phenomena, karma and an affliction. Now, what's terrific about this, and, and this is the thing that so, you know, we ask, so why do I want to know about the origins? This is, for me at least, like a when, it went, when I understood, it was like, oh, my gosh, I realized my wrong thinking. Yeah. And it might happen for you, too. Yeah. When we understand the origins, this is what it does, right? It stops the idea that suffering comes from only one cause. And I'll just ask you, how many times in the past have you looked back for the single cause of your suffering? So it doesn't come from a single cause. No, it's, it's always a perfect storm, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that's right. You've got to have, it's, yeah, it's made up of many factors. And, and I think, you know, this is where we go wrong. We're often looking, if we could just do this, find this one thing, we'd be right. But that's the mistake. It's not one thing. It's always two things. <laughs> right? It's always two you know, for, for instance, and this, and this comes, you see this through training, right? Suppose there's somebody that, that whenever you see them, whenever you come in to, to meet them, you're always upset, right? You just find that, man, like I can't, be, you know, Mother's Day was today, yesterday, sometimes people have a great problem with your mothers, don't they? You, know, you go home and you know, God, it's, it's not going to be easy. I know it's Mother's Day, but I'm going home to see my mum, and I know what my mum is like, and it's difficult. Now, this happens for some number of people. Yeah. 
that's how it is, right? So, but then suppose we we, we acknowledge that and go, look, I don't want to. When you know, Mother's Day comes, I go home. It's like a, I don't want that anymore. I, I want to have that change. I want to be different towards my mum. Right? So we undergo some some training. And then over time, we go back there and we don't have the old response that we had to our mum. Right? This is possible, isn't it? I mean, this is the idea of training. We go home and now we, we can appreciate mum and we're calm. Mum has not changed at all. She's the same mother she's always been, but we're different. We changed. Now, if you look back and go, so what's actually changed here? Because mum is still the same mum. You're going to say, man, it's my thinking, right? I've changed my thinking. So the, the, this, the habit that we had, the normal habit that we had, can't take off. Right? The habit we had before was aversion towards mum, upset, short-temperedness, you know, all this stuff, and looking at mum in a negative light. Right? That was the old habit. And out of that came suffering for ourselves and difficulty, difficulty in the relationship. We change our thinking through our spiritual endeavours, through our training. Mum's the same. The relationship is all different. And this is because like, the afflictions, we, we, you know, we've changed the thinking. Before it was we brought afflictions in. Uh, and then we had this habitual response. Uh, so we, we, we can get at the afflictions, have a different way, and create a new habit. I, Eddie, I have a question or a comment. I'm not sure yeah. which one. <laughs> but um, this is all complicated further by, um, um, you mentioned Ukraine, by trauma, let's say in children, oh. trauma. And I mean, there are so many people in the world who have experienced different kinds of trauma, but I'm talking about very, very deep, deep trauma, such as children in Gaza. If they survive the experience and if they get a lot of mental counseling, some of it can be um, the, the brain, the networks in the brain can be reconnected somehow so they can find a way to overcome suffering perhaps. But it's also possible that they don't get all the treatment they need. That's probably likely. Mm -hmm. And a certain trigger could really really disrupt their men mentality they're maybe sure. they've reached a state where they think oh well my life is good now i have you know i have a secure home i have a stable family life and everything and then but they have this trauma deep in their brain actual yeah. injury to their brain from psychological causes of violence extreme you know they can still be triggered yeah. they can still be triggered yeah. by the, the right conditions, like you were saying. Yeah. So this is all very complicated. I guess that's my only point. This is trying to figure Susan, out. Huh? I think, um, I think your, your answer is actually in exactly what you said, that there is the, um, the experience of, of, of the trauma, and then later on when we get re-triggered it's like there's two things now it's not just the one thing so you can't say the trigger is the cause and you can't say the original trauma is the cause they're all working together it's not just the one cause and then yes exactly you know all the rest of the conditions whether you have support now even if you didn't have support in the past all of those factors all come together and play their own part so you can't say it stops us being fatalistic and saying you've had this trauma in the past, there's nothing you can do about it because every way, even if it was, there's still 
more conditions around that mean we can have a different result. Yeah. I, I don't think there's nothing we can do about it. I think it's unpredictable what we can do about it in some extreme cases. You know? Okay. Um, I've just noticed the time and it's gone by. <laughs> so I'm not going to do, let's just put aside the meditations um, and we'll just keep going through in these different factors. Um, this, the truth of origin is also called a strong producer. And they call that because craving and karma, delusion and karma, affliction and karma, are strong producers. Now, they act forcefully to produce strong types of suffering, which is just what you mentioned, Susan. Yeah. And uh, as you're talking, Susan, I was thinking, you know, like, this goes for us too. Um, it seems much more obvious to us when you see what's going on in Gaza or any, any other country where there's a war, U Ukraine, you know, we, we can see um, events that we know are going to create a lot of trauma for our people. And that's just seen in this slide. So when you think of it like beginning of slides, the different forms of traumas that we must have all gone through and never been able to deal with them all, never been able to actually get to the root cause and remove it. So what we find is, is like for you and I and Barbara, all of us here, we haven't, um, you know, at, at present, we, we're not in the same, we're not experiencing the same conditions as those in Gaza or the Ukraine or any other place in the world, right? And that's really the only difference. Because right? if we found we were there, <laughs> um, I doubt very much we'd be behaving like we are quite simply like we are now, right? All our buttons would be pushed. And uh, I don't know how we behave. It's very hard to say, isn't it? Uh, and, then if, and then if we were to come out of there um, and then it, if we put back in our same situation, we would have been affected by it. It would have had an influence on us. Uh, so, so when I look at these things, I look at it as like this you know, beginningless mind stream and go, man, that, what's happening to them has happened to us. Where we are now, they once were. Right? But it's changed. And, and there's so much like out of our control, it's conditioning us. Right? So we get these habitual responses, the karma. What's driving the habitual responses? Man, the craving, the fear, the desire. Right? So we produce great... Um, effects and in this case we're talking because we're talking about suffering the effects are of suffering so the idea behind understanding these strong producers is to stop this notion that suffering arises from discordant causes now what what does what does this mean so really when we talk about karma and and affliction we're talking about the mental life of ourselves, aren't we? Right. So that means that a discordant cause would be for me to blame Barbara for my affliction, for the way I feel. Right. So Barbara here is like a contributing condition, but she's not the major cause. That's my disturbing emotion. Uh, it's the same sort of thing if you look at any country at war. You can't say it's the people. Uh, the people are conditions. If you look, at it, there's all sorts of conditions. If you look, what are the causes? You know, the afflictions and the habitual response to these situations. And, and here we're looking at, you know, like I said, the inner producers karma and the delusion. 
We got this. These are the actual origins of our, of suffering. The origins and the causes, the, the primary, deepest causes and origins, they're not external to us. They're not the people. They're not what people say. They're not what people do. Right? It, it's what's going on back here in the mind. What's what's driving what they say and do, and what's driving how we respond or react. What's terrific about this is that you you just have to stop blaming others for the harm. You have to stop blaming others for the suffering. Eddie, this is such a good, clear example, though. That what I've found is that when I hear stop blaming others for it, then I, in my mind I go, therefore it's my fault. <laughs> but actually this shows it's not my fault either it's karma and delusions fault yeah. isn't it yeah so yeah the, the buddha never said never pointed either to himself or any other person and said you know you're the fault you're the problem maker ever it was always karma and delusion this is where the faults are afflictions and behaviors And Eddie, conversely, yeah. um, other others are not responsible for our happiness. That's right. Exactly. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah others. Um, yeah, that's right. Others can't make us happy, Bob. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, you know this yourself. You try to make others happy. Well, hey, you can't. You know, you, and it's the same with us wanting, making, having others make us happy. Well, if they can't. Uh, so this, this is, I think when you get your head around this, you find um, how much responsibility you have and, and how much um, you actually can respond. Because most of our inabilities to respond are because of our afflictions. The less we have of them, the more, more capable we are. The greater the afflictions are, the less capable we are. And finally, these, these are conditions for suffering. So we can see them as cause and condition. So don't, you know, again, so it's this idea, don't get sort of locked in to go, no, they're just causes, they're just causes. No, they're also conditions. Edie, the, um, the plant analogy, you know, like the seed is the cause of the plant and the plant's the result, but then also the plant is the cause of the seed and the seed's the result. So it just, it's not that it's contradictory, it just depends which perspective we're looking at it right. from. Yeah, it's perspective. That's right. Yeah, so these, yeah, so it's like, yeah, there's a cooperation between the seed and the moisture and the soil and all that. And, you know, so just like having, um, if you, in, term, in terms of the plant analogy, if you just had the seed of the plant, no sunlight, no water, no warmth, nothing, no, 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 no. no. We, the seed just stays the same, doesn't it? It can't give rise to a plant. Right? But, but conversely, you can have as much water as in sunlight and warmth and all these sort of things. If you don't have a seed, you're not going to get a plant. Right? So they, 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 <laughs> they work together. Understanding conditions spells this idea that you know, at the difficult states that we find ourselves in cannot be overcome. Because it's like what Miffy pointed out before, like, you know, just remove the conditions. And, and we often, that's, that's what we normally do, don't we? we? But the conditions we often work on are outer conditions. We don't work on the conditions of the mind. We work on what we can do around us and make life easier for ourselves. 
But that's not a really skillful way, is it? Because we don't have very much control over that. You know, like for, if you look at what's happening in Gaza and the Ukraine, before these wars broke out, that's what they were doing, right? Just moving around the, alter, the outer conditions. And then they changed. So we'd be much better off working with you know, our inner conditions, our inner causes. Understanding this is this idea to understand that nothing is fixed. So we can look at this from, from a, again from perspective in terms of suffering, but also in terms of the absence of suffering. Just like uh, in the garden, right? You can have weeds or an absence of weeds. You can have the flowers in the garden or no flowers in the garden. Uh, you go like, why? He says, well, the conditions. I just don't put the seeds in there, <laughs> you know? Or I do stuff to the ground and, hey, I don't get no flowers and I don't get any weeds. Or I don't do anything and I get flowers and weeds. It's the same with the mind. But in summary, this is, this, again, so, you know, like this will go up on your guys' site, it'll be saved. It's a very quick way of just looking at it and going, okay, so what, when I get myself into trouble, what, what am I doing? What's the mind doing? Am I looking for one cause? Or I think it's just a completely random thing? Or am I looking outside myself for the causes? But do I just think, oh, damn, there's no escape. It's like this will never change. But so, I mean, we do this. And the idea is, is just to find out like, when we're doing it and then to write it, to stop doing it because we're wrong. It's wrong. And now that we've been able to identify where we've gone wrong, we can go right. Now, um, again, of course, is I mean, it's like the same. Barbara, Sue's, Mike, you know, like there's Just a lot. Stop the share. Can you no, stop we've the share? Go on. Oh, okay. go on right? And again, of course, there's a meditation we could have done, but. I already see we're over time. <laughs> no, no, we, we, we're, um, don't we have, we've got time for a meditation? Because it's only just 12.30 now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is our last meditation. So again, just get yourself comfortable in your seat. You want your spine to be straight. Stop the share. But you yourself are relaxed. You can have your eyes closed or have them partially open. It's up to you. And without trying to control or manipulate the breath in any way, be a witness to the flow of each inhalation and exhalation. And let your awareness expand. You notice these sensations throughout your body. And if thoughts arise, you can know that without getting caught up in them. So just as clouds can drift across the sky, let experience come and go.
and this coming and going reveals to us impermanence and change. Now, I want you to just imagine a bucket in a dark well. And this image connotes the suffering that we endure. We are like that bucket in a dark well. We're caught in the cycles of craving and karma. Now, the causes of our suffering often seem external to us. But it's the mind itself, which is the source of our problems and the freedom that we seek to be free from problems. So all experiences arise from the mind. And when our intentions and our actions are rooted in uh, ignorance and reactive behavior, These actions will propel us into suffering. But if we can respond uh, skillfully, then we open a door to liberation. So I want you to acknowledge the role your thoughts and your emotions and behaviors have played uh, in your circumstances. And then reflect on how craving and forms of behavior have driven our very own experiences of dissatisfaction. And then commit yourself to countering the origins of suffering through Dharma practice. And then I'm breathing in deeply through your nostrils. Exhale through the mouth. And allow your awareness now to come back into the room. And we'll come to the, this final slide about what, what can we do with this knowledge? Now, one thing is you always remember um, impermanence, causes and conditions Karma and afflictions are impermanent by nature. So there's nothing fixed about them. But they come and go. They can be interrupted. You can change them. You can change the conditions. You can change the causes. That's within our power. Now, knowing this, exert some effort. Right? I mean, I'm sure, like, we're all Dharma people, right? It requires effort to decrease suffering. It requires uh, effort to produce states of virtue. So knowing that change is possible, um,
um, decide to make these changes. Decide to say, free your own mind. So afflictions and habitual behaviors have imprisoned us into ways of behavior and thinking. The, you know, they're the troublemakers. But so please don't blame yourself and don't blame anybody else. It's you know. <laughs> so, yeah, the wonderful thing about this is like if you think, okay, so the problems here are afflictions and karma. Has any um <laughs> When we say this to ourselves, or when you hear somebody else say that to you, uh, I think it's very helpful to recognize that immediately. How are these terms appearing to you? And how does how does this word affliction or karma appear to you? Well, sometimes when you say it like that, you think me. <laughs> You think you are the affliction. Oh, okay. Well, and that's, I mean, clearly we're not, but it's just kind of this um, assumption that, I, that, that we just hear without even knowing when we hear karma and affliction, we think it's us. Yeah. Okay. So that, we don't think that, we're afflicted. <laughs> yeah. So then if, if we're like, so that's certainly one way we could see it. But there's another way too, isn't it? It's like there's me and there's the affliction. And this affliction is going to get me. Right? My, these karmas, like they're going to affect me. So now, that we've got, now we've got two different things. The affliction and the karma and there's me. Well, like Miffy said, me and the affliction or me and the karma are one and the same thing. Is that how it appears to you guys? Or is there some different way? Now, if the karma or the affliction seems separate, different from you, um, have a look for it. Right? You try and find it. You identify it. Tell me what you find. And the other way, of course, is you know, like if you're saying, you know, we, we think we, we are the affliction. We are. We are karma and delusion. Um, again, I could ask you, um, well, who's this me you're talking about? Like, how does this me exist that is karma, that is affliction? So this this last bit, I'm just sort of suggesting to you, is the very is the result right? when you know karma, like when you know how it exists. This is about this part, that last bit. That's so where you're really saying, lies. like, we can negotiate with it, we can negotiate with afflictions. Well, well, well again, you know, so if you're going to negotiate with something, there's got to be something there to negotiating with it, isn't there? So I'm just asking you to sort of, <laughs> like, okay, what's your negotiating with? Tell me more about that. Directly, not not thought, not made up, but like here it is, right? We can just look at something differently from a different perspective. Yeah, and this different perspective is directly without um, overlaying thought on it. So it is this what you're saying, like the the deepest way of looking at it, where if you look at it directly begins to dissolve. Um, well, in fact, no, not even that. There is, no, there is no dissolving process that takes place. It isn't a thing that dissolves. 
Just to be explicit here, are you talking about an emptiness meditation when you're asking all of these questions and prompting us with these questions? Well, that's what's going to happen. Right? You're going to see that the phenomena does not exist at all in the way that you think of it. The way that you're speaking of it and the way you're thinking of it, it's not there like that. This is when you look, right? When you don't look, when you talk about it and you think about it, now, it's, now, now you've got a real thing again. Right? And, and then you've got to use all these different methods and so forth, change your behaviours and all that. And that, 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 you know, that's good. Anyway, <laughs> this is just the other side of it, right? <laughs> you can also do that. Uh, That's so, Eddie, what, it's like the delusion dissolves? The delusion dissolves? Well, the idea of what mm -hmm. a delusion is dissolves, yeah. So you don't have the idea anymore. I like that word Miffy used, dissolves. <laughs> it's a very <laughs> useful <laughs> word. Yeah, it just, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, anyway. It, but Eddie, it's, That's it's, for the next installment. It's what you're saying, they don't dissolve because they're not there to begin with. Yeah, that's right. There's got to be, you know, if you say it dissolves, it's like got to be something there to dissolve, doesn't it? But, but when you like look, you don't see that. What? What? Time is dissolving now, yeah. Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but just like we don't see time dissolving, it's like that, right? <laughs> Oh, we know it's going by. <laughs> I have to dedicate. All of this stuff is going to be in the next exciting episode. <laughs> oh, that's right. That's the empty stuff. <laughs> yeah, the empty and selflessness. Okay, dokie. <laughs> forward to the next episode. <laughs> yeah, we know that, you know, this is what we should we should know, right? You have to read it out. Okay, so we know what this, this, this truth of origin is. It's got these four attributes. And we can recognize where we're going wrong with it, and we can write it. You know, so some of those things were, the simplest ones were, there's not a single cause for suffering. But so don't, don't make it harder on yourself looking for the single cause of your suffering. There isn't a single cause. Understand that your own suffering is created by karma and delusion. So these are conditions. There are two. And these can't, they're not stable. It's, they never stay the same. That's, that's all in flux. And if you, like I said, if you directly try to find it, you won't find it. It's not there. But so there's also the freedom that's there too, which is what we'll come to next week. And finally, this uh, daily contemplation is, like I said, remember, nothing is fixed. Um, so keep trying. Be resilient. Don't give up. There's no need to give up. In fact, what you, all you need to give up is the wrong ideas. That's what we want to give up. So until we see each other again, and hopefully we're still alive too, uh, that read anything you can about this material and try and make it um, clearer to yourself. And be gentle because it takes time. It takes time to integrate it, not just to hear it and to read it. And, you know, you guys have been so good, so much questioning. It, it, it's really good. So this is merit we're creating, energy. energy. We want to direct it towards enlightenment for the benefit of others. We want to direct it in a way that um, serves the relationship we've had with our teachers to repay their kindness. So join me in saying, due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha 
and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel, Bodhicitta, not yet born arise and grow. May that born have no decline, but increase forevermore. And as long as space remains, and as long as sentient beings remain, may I too remain to dispel the sorrows of the world. And in holding and spreading the Muni's precious and complete teachings, through explanation and practice, you wore the armor of patience that is never discouraged. Incomparable, venerable Guru, to you I uh, make this request. Please appear quickly upon this place we call Earth and let's have a relationship again with you. Stop the sharing. Oh, yeah. That's worse than <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you for being here, spending time with me and, and making my life meaningful. So look after yourselves. Be good. We'll see you again. Thank you.